this a bus stop? Take a seat, if you wish. There's some kind of schedule or? Bus comes every hour on the hour. Of course it does. Hungry? Huh? Are you hungry? No, man, I'm not taking your food. How do I know you're not gonna roofie me or something? Roofie? It's just cinnamon and brown sugar. Just no thanks, all right? Look at that. What my wife would call the perfect square. Huh? The square, don't you see it? Yeah, but what's so great about squares? The power of force, of course. Uh, I think it's these. Trinities, art, celebrity deaths. Directions, the elements, the seasons. Okay. Maybe I see your point. Maybe you're a little square yourself. <laughs> All right. Let me try one of those things. I am kind of hungry. Mmm. Squares. I'm sold. So where are you off today? Look, I appreciate the pastry, but I'm not about to tell you. Sopapilla. Excuse me? It's called a sopapilla. Sure, whatever, man. But you can't go around asking girls too many personal questions. You heard of me too? I'm ready for a just me kind of morning, right? I'm headed off to the old white coats myself. What? Kansas City Hospital. That's where I'm going. Oh. You okay? At your age, maybe not, huh? I'm okay. It's my wife that's sick. Jeez. Uh, I'm sorry, that's rough. Just a little pneumonia. She'll pull through. Eh. What? Tell that to James Brown. Who? James Brown, godfather of soul. I know who he is, but what does it have to do with- He the... died of pneumonia in 2006, and so did Brittany Murphy, and she was only in her 30s, so. Well, you're my Ryo the soul. Sorry, celebrity deaths, kind of my thing. You know any real stars, or only the ones that you pull out of that machine you're rubbing? Yeah, it's called a phone, and try me. All right, James Dean. Easy, car crash, 1955. Natalie Wood. 1981. Official story is drowning, but we all know it was murder. Lupe Vélez. Who? Lupe Vélez, the Mexican Spitfire. Oh, come on. That's some obscure shit right there. I said celebrities. Are you kidding? She was a real star. She had a series named after her. Well, I never heard of her. You heard of Gary Cooper? Prostate cancer, 1961. Why? Some say Lupe was pregnant with his child when she died. So how did she? It was supposed to be the perfect death. The stage was set with dramatic flair. Like a movie. Yeah, that's right. See, there she is, slinking down the stairs in her silk blue dress. Now she's welcoming her glamorous friends to dinner. They have no idea. Not a clue. Everyone's laughing and smiling. And then when the last guests leave, Lupe goes upstairs, lays in her bed of flowers, and takes the poison. Oh, man. What kind? I don't know, but it really doesn't matter because at that point, something changes. But she rushes to the bathroom, hits her head on the pot, and drowns. In the toilet, no. True story. I'm looking that up. Whoa, you weren't lying. Here, Lupe thought she was making the grandest of exits. Instead, she ended up being ridiculous. Well... Not that ridiculous. We're still talking about her death today, aren't we? What we should be talking about is her life. Forget that hot tamale, Spanish cyclone stuff. Lola, it's much more than that. Lupe. What? It was Lupe Velez, right? You said Lola. I think I'll have another sopapilla. So what about you? You just plan on going gently off into that good night or what? A Dylan Thomas fan. 
I'm impressed. Pneumonia, 1953. Sorry, forgot. Some things are just out of our hands. One has to ride the waves or get swept up by the currents. Oh, come on, Confucius. You must have some type of wish. Well, if I did, I wouldn't tell you about it. It's a death wish, not a shooting star. Spill it. Oh, I guess I have been thinking about my ashes. Uh, yeah? What about them? It could be really cool to spread my ashes every place I've ever lived. That's a really good wish. Too bad you had to spoil it by <laughs> telling me about hey. it. Hey! Kidding! So, what's the first stop then? La Yarda. What's a uh, Yarda? It's the place the railroad built for all the Mexican workers year-round, known as the Yard. Sounds kind of like jail. Maybe. But we made it into a playground. Running through the woods with the big kids during the day and grinding masa with the grown-ups at night. And the music. Man, it creeps up through the cracks of the walls right into your soul. Layarda, Lawrence, Kansas. Oh. Looks like a flood took it all the way, huh? You get all that from that little hand machine? It's called a phone, man. Maybe you ought to look up from it once in a while. Yeah? So what am I missing? Look down the street. This is where my next handful of ashes are going. All I see is fancy beer and art galleries. This is where the Mexicans built their houses after the flood. Well, I don't think they're here now. They got torn down in the 70s for a highway that never came. So is it true what they say about bad things happening in threes? Well, they do keep trying to push us out. Most of the Mexican families left, found jobs in Kansas City, Topeka, but not me. You can spread my ashes out in this area in a span of five blocks. That's either really cool or kind of sad. I can't tell which. Maybe a little bit of both. How about you? Where are your bones going to find home? Me? Oh, I don't know. Probably just off in the cloud. Like this thing here. I didn't grind. What? I got my memories, my music, my people. What more do you need? What about roots? They just tie you down. I gotta go where the gigs are. And you get there by bus. I'm impressed. Don't be. My car's in the shop. Maybe it's not the worst thing. What? That my car broke down. Tell that to my wallet. I mean the bus. Gets you out of your bubble, you know? Well, that bubble would have floated me all the way to my next show by now. Be careful. Sometimes those cages go pop. Hey, do that again. What are you going to do with that? You ever hear of looping? It's electronic, like laying sounds on top of one another to create something new. Here, check it out. Hey, you okay, man? What time is it? Uh, 10, 10.30. You know, I don't think this bus is coming. It comes every hour on the hour, every hour on the hour. Well, not this hour. I've got to get to the hospital. Yeah, I know. Look, I think I'm gonna head downtown and pick it up there. You wanna come with? Kansas City? Yeah. All right. Hey, Julio, stop. Hey, buddy, it's lunchtime. Lunch? It's pizza, cut up in little squares, just the way you like it. Lunch. Hey, where are you going? What, what just happened here? Julio's one of our patients. He can't just go somewhere without prior arrangement. Patients, but he was just taking the bus to see his wife. Lola died in 2016. What? Pneumonia, I never met her. But from what I hear, she was quite the character. A spitfire. Yeah, that's right. So wait, is this even a real bus stop? Oh, real enough. We used to have a problem with our dementia patients wandering off. They didn't know where they were headed, just they needed to get somewhere. 
So we created this place to be a stopping point for them. The wishing bench. If I came back tomorrow, would he remember me? It's hard to say, but he might like getting to know you all over again. Wait. The soap up he has, who makes them for him? Oh, the box is just part of his routine, like the bench. There's nothing in there. Hi, everybody. My name is Marla Hill. I'm the director and writer of the Wishing Bench film, and I'm joined today by some of our key cast and crew, and so I'd love to introduce them now. Uh, we have Mike Quillen and Alex Kimba-Williams, who are the musicians from the original soundtrack of the film. We have Nathleen Rufuku and Jose Faust, who are the two leads of the film, and Rick Averill, who had a fabulous supporting role. So hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this film was made with a grant from the Lawrence Art Center's Art Place America grant and was made as part of the Rebuilding East Ninth project. So I really want to give a big shout out to the creative team behind the Rebuilding East Ninth project and all of the incredible East Lawrence residents that came forward with stories and photographs and archival material that really helped bring this story to life. I thought we could begin with a little icebreaker. And if you're watching, joining us uh, here on Facebook or YouTube, you can feel free to shout any comments or questions in the chat and we'll get to them as we go. But I thought we could start by asking you all um, if you think these two characters will see each other again. You think these two will encounter one another. What do you think? Maxine, can we start with you? <laughs> yeah, I think they will. I feel like, you might go back. I always had that feeling like she might actually go back there, but it might be kind of weird for her just because she's aware that you may not remember her. But you think in her heart she would probably return? Yeah, that's yeah. what I sort of felt too when I was thinking. Uh, Jose, what do you think? No, I, I agree. I thought uh, the way it, she kind of goes through this journey with him, I just thought she wasn't ready to leave it. You know, like, yeah, she's going to come back and there's more journey there, I guess. And do you think maybe that when she, if she did come back, like would she reframe perhaps her conversation with him? Do you think they might revisit some of those topics or what do you guys think about that? I don't know. I kind of feel like she might try and recreate their interaction. So she might act similar to how she did the first time, maybe a little bit nicer, maybe, but <laughs> not sure. Mike, and, uh, Mike, what do you think? Well, I definitely think she would recreate the and and sort of have fun with it in a way like but caringly. But yeah, I think she would her character seems kind of kind of fun like that. That she would she would want to keep them company, but also kind of have fun with them too. Like you know, recreate the experiences. Yeah. But Alex, what's your take on it? <laughs> I think that she would visit him again because I'm sure that she'll need to um, or sample the clap and some other sounds that, that I think she would have pressed in. Um, I would go back for a good sample. 
Um, so I, I could see them meeting up again and her trying to maybe record his stories or maybe collect that sample. I love that. It's so funny. I've never thought about that mm -hmm. angle of it. That makes a lot of sense. Rick, what do you think? I Yeah, I, I'd love to invite her. If I saw her a second time, I'd tell her, come over. We have visiting hours sometime and you could come over and and uh, and see you might you might meet some other people you're interested in. So I would like that she was engaged, you know, engaging with him because that helps the patients. Yeah. From the nurse's standpoint, did you think that he would welcome? Did he expect her to come back, or what do you think? Like when he she leaves with the box, like do you I, feel like that was an invitation to come back? I, you know, I. I don't know. You, you might hope that he might begin to recognize her. So it could be kind of a breakthrough thing if he if he resonates and is able to tell her story to her, then it gives him a grounding mechanism and maybe maybe helps him, uh, you know, maybe helps him with his recovery or with with maintaining his link to the world in what ways that might still be important. Um, He's got a vibrant life. You know, he yeah. really lives in his memories very well. So, yeah. Yeah. When I was trying to think of dementia and what stage he might be at, he was kind of in that in between stage where he still is very vibrant and able to live his life pretty fully. Like, even doesn't matter what time place that he's in, he's present in those moments. So, I really liked that um, interpretation of it. And it's, you did such great performance things like some subtle things in your acting and it was like at the end even when you walked off i'm like oh he really feels like a different person when i see him mobile so it was really interesting mm -hmm. it was a great performance but i like for me. <laughs> <laughs> i like that Richard. next time she'll bring the sofa i love, I love that, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maxine i wonder if you could talk a little bit about do you think that your character was changed by this experience on the bench and how if so i do think she's changed um trying to find a nicer word she's a bit cold i'll put it that way so i feel like if anything maybe she'll be somewhat warmer but most likely to be to anyone that reminds her of him it's kind of the vibe i get she could probably go on with her life just it would be like hot and super cool but Anyone that reminds her of him, she might be more warm and compassionate with. Mm. I love that. And I think your performance was so nuanced as well, where you kind of showed these great moments of being guarded, but then vulnerable. And it was it was great. And you just went very quickly between those two and you just took us on that ride. Um, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it was a really, really powerful performance to watch, I felt. Yeah, I like the, the coyness that she has too, right? Like she's this old man. Okay, all right, I'll humor him. He gave me a sopa pilla. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, okay, I'll go along. With, you know, it's like that breaker. But she still has like this always checking him, right? The yard. Well, let me look that up. But then it's interest, right? It's curiosity. Right. She's like going into his stories. So yeah, it seems like there's a real good bond there. And to me, it doesn't really matter if he's where he was before i think about where she is every time she comes to the bench right that's that's kind of the way it reads to me yeah that's a really good point because yeah his he would be in that same mind space and then she'd be experiencing different things in her life coming to that bench like that. do you think that he changed jose like if from that experience like what is the impact of her visit on him do you think well i think the well, you see how much he loved his wife, right? Lola is his Lupe Vélez, right? I mean, he, so he's, he knew Lupe probably when he was a young boy. So Lupe, because I think she was in the 40s or something like that. And so he that would have been, you know, and so then when he grows up, he has his own Lupe. And she, you know, that, you know, you could tell that he lived this life totally with her. Uh, the yard, uh, the, just the gatherings when they sit around and talk about the place and the, so yeah, I think I think he's changed in that it brings that up. I mean, he's always there. He's always going for Lola, anyways. But now he actually gets to talk with Lola, like you know, this is Lola, and you see it. It was beautiful. 
I love that connection between Lola and even uh, Mira, the main character, like, you know, connecting those two because they are both Spitfires and just having those interesting, really strong female personalities. I think that's a great connection. Um, Alex and Mike, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the music, like thinking of those two characters, you were able to see the film before you started working on the music, how much, because Mira's character was a musician, did you feel like, how did you blend representing those two characters' journey through the soundtrack? Um, I'll go first. I usually go first when it's, when it's me and Mike. I'm very, um, we have a good dynamic. Uh, I, I really enjoyed putting music to these characters. You know, my, uh, my earliest musical experiences um, involved jazz and a lot of Latin jazz and a lot of blues. And I really enjoyed infusing that, I think, into quite a bit of what I contributed. And I, of course, uh, really got down and enjoyed a lot of just the electronic, almost like kind of like dark pop and other kind of elements that we brought and that Mike has um, taught me um, through the years that we've been playing music together. But I'll hand it off to Mike. Yeah. Um, so the the initial, you know, screening of the, 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 the stuff I watched of it, I just I just thought of uh, like a lot of uh, atmospheric layers for when you're in between two worlds. So so some of the the stuff I you know I recorded stuff like that all the time. But but it was it was interesting how you used it as a transition piece. Um, uh, but when he's sort of going between the worlds and then you, you hear the clapping of uh, of whatever he's hearing on the yard with that that beat I made and it was like oh yeah that, that works perfect <laughs> weird moment and it's it's great it's like so I really I really liked how it fit there but but overall like I write a lot of stuff that ends up sounding cinematic um, just in general like when I mess around with stuff I like I like spacious sounds big sounds so that was uh, I, th I think if it just kind of you know just mixed really well and I'm I'm really glad you made it that way. So it's great. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I love how that soundtrack it encapsulates kind of a otherworldly presence. So like, you know, the there's some surreal elements to the story and it takes us there through the music, but then it's not overly done. Like we never feel like oh. we're not in a sci-fi film. We're not in a time travel mm -hmm. situation. We're here and we're grounded with these two people. And I thought it just fit that mood perfectly. Yeah. And not overly dramatic either. Like, like it could have because of the whole mysterious disappearance of the Sylvia, could have had a horror kind of vibe to it. You know, it could have been like, like yeah. what is going on? Like, like really kind of eerie if you did <laughs> it the wrong way. You know, could have took a weird turn. But I think it it took a really heartfelt turn, and that's what I like about it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and we could we could have brought the the scary vibes. We could have we have we have the sounds and the effects to have done that. Um, but yeah, I liked I liked um, how me and Mike were able to kind of collaborate virtually uh, through COVID, and because we are electronic artists, we were already kind of doing that before. And so when this project came into our laps, we were already a little bit prepared and experienced in doing this. Um, and so um, we're just appreciative to have had something like this to work on and like something that we that we looked forward to, I think, musically through this, through, uh, through the pandemic as well. Yeah, just hanging on to connections. That's what this is about. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was such a fun thing with the timing where we were able to just kind of go back and forth via email. And, you know, I kind of took bits and pieces of different samples and you guys provided such great choices. And I would kind of play around with putting different pieces, different places, and it would totally change the mood of it. So it was just, mm -hmm. it was a great timing for me too, to just sit there with this great material and put it together. We have a question that came in. What led to the choice of Lupe Velas as part of the story? Um, I can respond to that one. We did these story circles as part of the public art component of the East <laughs> project. And I got to listen to some wonderful stories from the Mexican American community. And there was something that sparked um, my interest in how to convey um, the, I want to say, not say audacity, but like the, the energy and the vivacity of some of the female characters that were represented in the story circles. And it seemed like having a visual that Maxine as a Hollywood death monger could tie into. So it kind of seemed like a great way to tie those two in. And then I was sort of leaving it 
a little bit open, like what might have happened to Lola, the wife character. You know, I kind of played around with could it be like, could it have been a suicide kind of situation or what it was? But then, you know, I kind of softened that up and I was like, then I just went with the pneumonia angle. So that was just a way to like connect between generations. And that's what I loved about Maxine's character was that she was, there was a nostalgic element to her. So she was very modern and she doesn't tie herself to a place, but she has this yearning for nostalgia. Like she loves to go and find these old stories and connect to other people. And that's why she's a great listener for Julio as well. Um, and so that just seemed like a great way to just to, to connect those dots together. That's a good question. And I just had so much fun watching those old Mexican Spitfire, old videos on YouTube. So if anyone's not familiar with Lupe Velas, go check her out. I and mean, she's just a fascinating, quick comic timing. And then also this great vulnerability as well. And that's what I sort of thought when I was picturing that character of Lola. Maxine and Jose, since when we filmed those scenes, especially you know when they're talking about Lupe, um, did you, had, were you familiar with her work or because we were all just on a black sound stage and then we put in all that footage later. So what was that like for your performance process? I feel like it made me connect more to my character because I also didn't know who that was <laughs> prior to this. I feel like I learned a lot just from reading the script. I did not know about La Yarda. I didn't know much about Lawrence. So yeah, the same way that my character is learning things, so was I. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it wasn't Lupe. I had knew about Lupe from uh, one of those one of those tell-all books about Hollywood, right? And I can't remember who it was, and it was like 20 years ago. It was like underground Hollywood or whatever. And so Lupe's story was in there. Uh, but La Yarda is kind of the the thing for me. These uh, communities that existed at one time and uh, no longer exist, and there's no memory of them. And then you see what comes in there. And it's like, you know, hopefully other communities that make other memories, but it's still, that I think is the part that um, is really nice to have. That's, that I went and looked up a little bit more, La Yarda. <laughs> and that's what I was sort of hoping too, that whatever happens to this film afterwards, I would love to use it as sort of an educational piece for it because there were so many communities around railroads through Kansas and Mexican American communities that have these great cultures and then Lawrence's culture is so interesting just because that flood changed everything. And so they had this really close knit uh, community and then had to spread out. So some people went to Kansas, some people went to Topeka, um, but then the heart of it stayed where some generations just stayed and were very active in the St. John's Fiesta. And it was really, really wonderful learning process in making the film to go into all those great photographs that the Watkins Museum had. Um, and then Steve Deaver did a beautiful job. Uh, he kind of edited these 3D animations of the images together. And I think that really added it to it as well. No, that was really beautiful. But it, you know, it, it tells that story of uh, how important the railroad was to actually bring in Mexicans up here um, and how the railroad really sent all this tech tentacles all the way up to Chicago mm -hmm. and other places, you know, just like the great migration. So yeah, it's a great story. I wonder too if, you know, I was looking, when I was writing this script, um, I stumbled upon, cause I kind of had you in mind, Jose, from the very beginning. Oh my God. I know. And, <laughs> the old grandfather type, right? <laughs> well, he's a wonderful poet as well as an actor and visual artist. And so I stumbled upon this quote, with the mind forgets the land reclaims. Oh, yeah, and yeah. I thought I would open that up to you all because that kind of fits in what we were talking about with Liarda. And what do you, do you think that quote might apply to this film? Um, I think about the connection between Julio and Mira, and especially when she says, that's either really cool or kind of sad, I don't know which. And just her connection to physicality in place and how her home may be not associated with physicality, but it might just be her creations and her connections to people in a traveling sense. So what do you think about that quote in terms of what it might mean for Julio and his location to East Lawrence or his tie to East Lawrence. Well, you know, that quote came from a project, a uh, friend Carmen Moreno did this, um, it was dealing with the West Bottoms uh, and it was the West Bottoms Reborn project. And so there was a component of public investment thing, but there was a, 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 an art component to it. It was looking at uh, the history of the West Bottoms 
And for me, the history was going back down there and seeing how many stories um, are no, I mean, you always have left the stories of many communities that went through there. So for me, it, it's a direct link. I mean, I love what you said about that. But, you know, that look where she looks at me, where she says, you know, it's either really sad or really, man, that's like, right, that's the heart of that. I mean, that's literally that, you know, you feel these, you stay in one place so long, like, what's your problem, <laughs> right? Isn't that, uh, it's a wonderful life, you know? It's like, what a wasted life to spend all your life wanting to get out and never being able to go. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it touches it on so many levels. So I'm glad you you used that quote. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it really speaks to the intergenerational thing, and that's what I loved about. It's what really attracted me to the story was the fact of having multi generations kind of come together, and we have different you know opinions and backgrounds of like how important a house is or how important a piece of land is. Uh, Maxine, could you talk a little bit about what it means to you, like from that character's point of view or yourself as an individual? I see, yes. So at least for the character, I think we learn throughout the script at least that she does not relate to who we own that sense where she wants to move, she wants to travel. I think within my own personal life, I don't know, I feel like me and Mira are kind of similar. But at the same time, I would like to eventually have a phase where it's like this location holds a lot of memories. So at the moment, that's KC, but I'm always willing to uh, travel somewhere else and find those memories within those new towns. Um, so it does relate to me personally and maybe a little bit to Mira, but maybe not as much for Mira versus Julio. Rick is a longtime Lawrence resident. Does that have any meaning for you? Like, how do you feel about that tight of place. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we're, I'm at the point where yeah, I was born in San Francisco, which explains a lot. And I grew up in Topeka, which explains other things. But I came to KU and fell in love with Camelot on the Ka, which is Lawrence. And, and I've been here forever. And I'm now at the point where this is where I'll scatter my ashes at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Jazz House and at the Carnegie Building and at the Lawrence Art Center and at Apple Valley. And it's like, you know, I, yeah, very much, not just roots, but the, the roots that my brothers and I got and sister got in Kansas. We, we have real deep Kansas roots because of doing all the touring and traveling all across the state and the region. Um, you know, I have a deep love for, uh, for this community, especially for Lawrence. Uh, also for Kansas, <laughs> um, but uh, but but so much for Lawrence, and and I've spent a lot of time uh, learning about the town that, that I live in to the point where I feel that that's part of my history. Uh, you know, it's an adopted history of this of this town, and I love it that we're the town that uh, is represented by the Phoenix that we rise from the ashes of our own uh, mistakes and and also things that are done to us that that's the that's the ethos of this town is to rise up and to continue to rise and to learn and to relearn alex how about you does it have any special meaning for you when you think about the the land reclaims what the time might forget oh yeah um being native i really appreciated the um not only the ties to lawrence history but land in lawrence um, was very special to me, um, having spent a lot of time mapping Lawrence and doing a lot of things like that. Um, I really loved the ties to land and then what you were talking about earlier, the ties to um, human psychology and then, the, of course, the fact that Jose's character um, seems to struggle with dementia a little bit and having studied neuroscience at school. Um, that was really, so you had so many themes in it that I was like, oh, I'm into that and I'm into that. And so it was just a joy to watch and to be part of. Um, but yeah, I think the ties to land, when we think about how the land, specifically East Lawrence, has changed through the generations and over the years, um, is really um, has a really interesting link to dementia and how, um, like I'm reading Reconsol um, Reconsolidation by Janice Lee right now, which is about how our memories change every time we revisit them. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if the, um, the neighborhood that um, Jose's character is in has changed and it probably seems to change in his mind every time he goes there. It seems like to go through that same mental process. Um, anyway, I could go on a long time about um, everything that I loved about um, the dementia aspects of the film, but yeah, definitely the ties to place were really cool. 
I love that. I have to check that book out because that's something that appealed to me too. And if I had more of a budget, I was almost thinking like a special effect when he's having that uh, breakdown. Um, I sort of wanted to convey that he was living, just like you said, like he's living in these different generations all at the same time. So every time he's going, he's sitting at that bench, he's seeing each decade as it's happening, but concurrently. So it's not like, oh, I'm remembering this way, I'm remembering this, I'm remembering this. It's all together. And so it's like a circle of time instead of just these linear delineations. So I love that. So. Oh yeah, almost like what uh, Maxine's character's cell phone probably provides for some people having everything in one place. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Mike, what do you think? Do you have any special? Yeah, um, yeah, so, the idea of there's a the you know the land reclaims you know similar the death theme the scattering of the ashes burial all those things uh resonated with me with this this film too because the, the death theme and the idea that he's living through his memory so he's he's actually alive in this other realm you know but right now he's you know seemingly heading towards you know death or whatever it's it's that duality of of uh things that really catches on to me. But yeah, the land reclaiming um, of the memories, the, it bringing up all the, all the, like you were saying, like like all, all these things from the past. And, um, and then the the travel, the travel element and the home element of, of, of finding a home, you know, and where is your home? You know, is it, is it in, you know, I think for, you know, the two different characters, they're, they're sort of crossing paths and finding home in that moment, you know, and it's, it's really interesting. And then being on sort of the bus stop or whatever, you know, the fake bus stop, that's a great thing too, because like you're, you're, you're preparing to, to go somewhere, you know, right. preparing to death or the transition or something too. Yeah. I think that ties in with her obsession with death, you know, mm -hmm. at the very yeah. beginning when she's recounting all those celebrity deaths, it's sort of her way of making it not so scary, you know, just finding a way to connect to it. And so then when she starts to open up to him, just even before they've traveled anywhere, you know, it's kind of when he she starts to worry, oh, you're going to the hospital, maybe something's wrong. And that's like the first moment where she starts to open up to him and get a little bit vulnerable for the first time. And she looks at him and says, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Michael. Can you talk more about how and you, Jose, became director and actor? For my, yeah, for my director, yeah, like, um, it was just something that I always enjoyed filmmaking in different, and I, what, I guess what I loved about filmmaking is it incorporated all these other arts, like photography, writing, music and it's a way to kind of bring those all together under one collaborative thing. I never liked to just create something by myself. I love to bring in people as much as possible. So this film was so much fun. And I think the grant was such an incredible opportunity because we were able to pay 19 contract artists, which doesn't always happen with a short film. So that's, I think, such a great uh, place for public funding for people to come together and each is bringing their own talent to the table and the whole thing becomes greater than what anything you would have done on your own. Jose, do you want to take that for how you became an actor? It's been an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it's I, you know, I, um, I. I'll be very honest with you. Acting to me is a pinnacle of something, right? I never understood that part where somebody says the actor takes over the role, right? Until um, I thought, you know, it's the writers got it, the directors doing it the actors but until you put you're put in that situation where you really understand right and you have to make choices or the choices are made for you um because something that another character has done that's terrifying for me <laughs> i uh it's it's um i don't know and so i I've, I've never really wanted to do acting and people keep asking me to do acting. <laughs> so that's how i stay in <laughs> as i've become an actor again but it is scary, man. It's like, it, you know, you mentioned 19 people were there, right? And it's, man, it was, that's a lot of people <laughs> for a 12 minute film. It's in that collaboration, that's like theater, right? You don't see all the people behind in theater, but theater is so awesome. And so this film carries that too. So, no, I, I'm blessed, I think, accidentally so. <laughs> Maxine, what drew you to acting? Oh my gosh. I've always wanted to act since I was a kid. I honestly think it was 
Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Because at the end of some of their episodes, that's when I realized that they're acting and it's not just a magic box. Because they would have like the little bloopers and then having to repeat their lines. I was like, oh, that was fun. So I just, well, I'm very dramatic. I don't know. I feel like Nigerians are just very dramatic people. And I wanted to like <laughs> do what Will Smith was doing. <laughs> so it's always been something I wanted to do since I was a kid. So I'm happy I'm getting the chance to now. And Maxine, your performance too, like it was really hard to cast this film because different people took that character in so many different directions. But there was just something when you came into audition, just the way you were able to switch, like you could go from here she is, she's tough as nails, she's coming in and then, whoa, you see this sensitive side to her, like just in the next line reading. And it was just nuanced and sophisticated and it was this whole other level that I, I cannot wait to see what you do next. So it's really exciting to, to see your, you know, journey. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so I Michael had that's what I that. meant. I was just, just going to add, uh, Maxine did a lot of things that I was seeing when she was reacting with me. And like It was like a different little thing that I was reacting to each time. I think that's what I mean about how you, you have to be awake, man, because things happen so fast. So, yeah. And it was a lot of fun to edit both of your performances because there were those little moments when something would change, like somebody would give a different reading on that take and then the, the other one would react and respond in a different way. So it was really fun to piece that together. Um, so Michael had a follow up and he said more particularly in this film, how you became director and actor. So for this film, like I said, Jose, like I think I'd seen you in a play in Kansas City. I feel like maybe it was at the Unicorn or the Coterie even, I can't remember what it was. Um, and I just knew, and I had sort of had this rumbling of this idea in my head. You know, I had listened to a podcast from Radio Lab about the dementia bench. There was in Dusseldorf, Germany, they had created this uh, faux bus stop for dementia patients to find a place to come to. And I just thought that was such a beautiful setting for a film because you have this um, interesting space where people are coming together. And there, you know, there's that potential for them to have a misunderstood interaction. Like one person's thinking it's a bus stop, the other person is coming here on their routine, and what that might um, come forward with. So, yeah, so that was how, you know, I knew initially that I wanted that character to be Mexican American, and then I saw you in some play that you were just fantastic in. And so that's, I knew it right away that I really wanted you to be in this film. And for me, it was just saying yes when she said, do you, do you want to be in it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It's very sweet. <laughs> A lot of love out there. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to pop them in that chat. Um, Rick, how did you start acting? Um, you know, I think my first big role was... Uh, Winthrop Peru in The Music Man when I was in the seventh grade, and they dyed my hair red with shoe polish because that's what they did back then. And I wore it the next day with pride to school because I was a red and I was a ginger. And, and one of the girls that I liked had told me that she liked it. And then I went to the shower back then. We all had to shower together. And it all washed off all over my body, body like blood pouring out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I became theatrical from that. And I've always been theatrical, actually, as my family. Mm. But I, I did more music. I actually wanted to be a music composer all the way. I did theater all the way through high school and college. But my undergraduate degree was uh, music composition. I was going to be a composer. And then I kind of fell into the uh, theater and scene group players. And then I fell from there into writing because we didn't have any other writers in our company. And so I became a playwright then. So it was kind of a wild journey. And you're a fantastic composer. Like I've seen so many of your theatrical productions where you've composing original music and it's breathtaking. So I love it when you get to do that. This, this music was great for this film. I really loved your music, you guys. It was very wonderful. Beautiful, Thanks. beautiful mm -hmm. contribution. I thought, mm -hmm. maybe, oh, go ahead. Did you have something else, Rick? No, I just saying I was correcting myself from saying you guys and saying you people, you folks. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
I thought maybe we could close by everybody giving a wish. I know that this film takes place at the wishing bench and it's this beautiful East Lawrence treasure where I've sat on it many times and just had these kind of reflective moments. And I didn't know if we could each share perhaps a wish that we might have, whether it's for now, whether it's for the year, for the future, East Lawrence, the film, whatever you would like to talk about. Maxine, would you like to begin? Yes, I wish that as many people as possible stay healthy during these times. <laughs> Jose, did you have one? Yeah, I, I second that, but I wish to hell that that wishing bench would still be there many years from now. No matter what happens, there people need to have moments of madness like that. We need it. And I think that is something wonderful that did come out of the project. Um, this wishing bench is at 9th and Delaware, and it's a site that could be easily developed like next year. So in the creation of this film, you know, we got to do some public information sessions about the grant and our projects in general. And this kind of sparked a conversation about what would happen to the wishing bench if it was to be developed. And immediately the neighbor started to connect um, and they found a place where it would go. So wow. it really, to me, that was like, okay, now I think we fulfilled our mission. Like we kind of, as a public art piece, we sparked a conversation that led to some action. So that made me really happy. Awesome. Mike, did you have a wish for the? Yeah, I, I, as far as, you know, film goes, you know, I, I, I wish that, you know, there'll be a time soon when we can all get together in person and watch a movie together, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, and just feel really comfortable and, you know, you know, roll around and be silly and, you know, that whole thing. So that's my wish. Yeah. That wish. Alex, did you have a wish to share? Yeah, I mean, I have lots, I'm such an optimist. I have so many wishes. Um, but I think what was really powerful, you know, related to the film is I hope that more films come out um, that speak to the nuances and the dynamics, I think, of characters with dementia. I think a lot of times films de um, depict people, older people in general, with this, but specifically people that exhibit signs of dementia, like they're funny or they're always like a side character. And I just really appreciate the respect and um, that there was a main character that um, that lived that life. And so I just think that that was really cool. And I just want to see more of that. I love that. And that was a really fun research process for this. I got to do some dementia training and there are all these wonderful nuances that I was able to interweave, like the watch that he wears. And that's kind of the signal for the nurse to come and be aware that he's mobile and he's moving. Um, and then also like the word choices, like he would get stuck on like whether he, you know, what the phone was, he'd say, oh, it's a talking machine or, you know, throw out some word choices like that. So it was a fun way to make it layered without heavy handed, you know, like we didn't go out of control with it, but just like slipping up between Lola or Lupe and it, it made it, it was a really interesting layer that it was fun, right? Yeah, no, it was very tasteful and I just, I appreciated that. It's great to hear. Rick, did you have a wish to share? Uh, wish for uh, just a continued awakening of these opportunities for collaboration, uh, for, uh, you know, just the, uh, I, I just love the, uh, the collaboration. I just love the intergenerational, uh, uh, inter, interracial, and just the whole uh, uh, pulling people together to tell new stories and stories that need to be told told as we go through, I hope, a, a reawakening of this country as we move towards reparations for the things that have happened in the past in relation to people of color. Uh, I love to, I wish for a dismantling of the patriarchy uh, and of white privilege and of a growth in America of caring uh, for other people as other human beings. That's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> we can do it. We'll do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I think we'll wrap there. My wish is to keep making projects with each of you and to connect with East Lawrence and to really further public funding for the arts. And I think this was such a gift to the community. I'm so grateful that this huge grant came to our East Lawrence community and we're able to do so many fantastic projects with this funding. So from here on forth, I love it. So thank you all. Uh, the film will be on Vimeo. I'll drop the link to the Vimeo file, which is a high res file in case anyone wants to see it in all its beautiful glory. 
and please spread the word about the film. We're gonna try to take it to some festivals once festivals go back to in-person versus virtual. And thank you all so much for tuning in today and have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.